Well, friends, we launched our new series last week in the Book of Acts. You might want to uh, get your cell phones out, keep them on silent, but you can uh, look up the Book of Acts, Google it, Acts chapter 1. There are Bibles on the sides as well. Don't be shy, jump up and grab one uh, if you'd like. Even in Isizulu there, you'll find one. Um, it'll be helpful if you can have the text open as we go through it. The Book of Acts was written, of course, by Luke who himself was a medical doctor and a historian, and he tracks the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church from Jerusalem all the way through Judea to Samaria, and finally to Rome, the ends of the earth. Last week, we saw how Jesus ascended back to heaven, but before Jesus left, he promised to send the Holy Spirit to the 11 apostles to empower them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Well, let's listen now as Sandy and Joe recap a verse or two from last week's passage and then bring us our next installment uh, from the book of Acts. Uh, thanks, Sandy and Joe. Morning. Um, the first reading is taken from Acts, chapter 1, 4 and 8, and 12 to 20. On one occasion, while Jesus was eating with them, he gave his apostles this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and son Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, and there he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that, feed in the, that field in their language a keldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Thanks be the word of God. Okay, we continue reading from verse 21 to 26. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus Christ was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry, which Jesus left to go where he belongs. They then cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, as you listened to that passage being read, did anyone else ask themselves, why this story is in the Bible, or is it just me? Uh, it's a bizarre story. Uh, sure, after Judas betrayed Jesus and committed suicide, some people might have wondered if anyone eventually took his place, but really, it's hardly the most pressing question in the world. Why not go straight from Jesus' follow, followers, uh, his mother, his brothers, uh, praying together in chapter 1? Why not go straight to the dramatic arrival of the Holy Spirit? In chapter 2, surely that's much more exciting than this long detour to find out who replaced Judas. 
especially since we don't know anything at all about this guy, Matthias. He's never mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. We have no idea what he did after he became an apostle. So what's going on? Why does Luke make such a big deal of Matthias when the apostles are just about to start taking the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth? Well, I think the answer lies precisely in the fact that the apostles were just about to start taking the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. You see, Jesus had just told the apostles that he was leaving them, but that he was going to work through them to continue to grow his kingdom to the ends of the world. Now, that's a huge responsibility, a huge task. And obviously, it's critical that the right people preach the right gospel. A counterfeit gospel will grow a counterfeit kingdom, won't it? False teachers preaching false gospels will end up growing false kingdoms, won't they? We see that all around us as false teachers draw people to themselves and give them what their itching ears long to hear. So the kingdom of God needs a trustworthy message and it needs trustworthy messengers to spread that message. Basically, Luke gives us this story so that we can trust the Bible. You can trust the message of the apostles because they were chosen and set apart by God himself as his authorized witnesses to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We can trust the promises that Jesus is going to make to the world through the teachings and through the writings of these 12 apostles. Let me try and explain it like this. Uh, imagine you get a letter like this from the central bank of Nigeria to tell you that very sadly, your very wealthy great uncle has just died. The letter explains that long ago, your uncle was the British ambassador in Nigeria, and he, while he was there, he opened a trust fund in your name, which is now worth 20 million pounds. You know where this is going. Hey? The catch, of course, the catch is that you have to send them 10,000 rand to cover admin costs, and then they will transfer the money to your South African bank account. Well, what do you do when you get a letter like that? It all depends on how reliable you think the letter is. I mean, who wants to throw 20 million pounds down the toilet? You'd want to find out whether the author is real and whether he has the authority of the bank to speak on their behalf. You'd want to find out whether you had such a great uncle who really was an ambassador in Nigeria and whether there really is a trust fund in your name. You'd want to see some convincing proof maybe several convincing proofs before you send off the 10,000 rand. Or oh, I really hope you would. I really hope you would do some checks before believing the promises of a stranger. So too with the promises that Jesus makes. Don't be gullible. You need to check them out. And that means you need to check out the apostles because they were the ones who wrote the Bible on Jesus's behalf. It is them who are making the promises, or at least it is them who are saying that Jesus made such promises. You need to have confidence in the apostles before you start staking your future on anything they say. Only once you're certain about what Jesus said and did in the past, can we get excited about what he's promised for the future. Only once you know you can trust the writers of the New Testament can you start believing that, you, that God really does love you, that God really did send Jesus to die for your sins, that you really can have eternal life despite not deserving it. Well, with that, let's get into our passage. The first thing I think Luke shows us is that you can be part of making God's plans for the world come true. Look at verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem, writes Luke, from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Altheus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the woman and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Did you notice an immediate problem, actually more than one, with the passage that I've just read? 
Firstly, when you add up the names, you get to 11, not 12. Secondly, when you compare this list of names with the lists of names in Matthew and Mark, when, God, when Jesus chooses the apostles, Thaddeus is missing. And more seriously, it seems like Judas has made a reappearance. Is this reincarnation? What's going on? Well, first, the problem with 11. You might not think that it's important to have a 12 apostles. I mean, couldn't 11 apostles do the job just about as well as a 12th apostle? You know, when, when one of the Springboks gets sent off in the World Cup final, well, the other 14 just have to step up, don't they? But friends, this is not a question of just getting the job done. The issue here is theological, not a problem with manpower. Jesus had deliberately appointed 12 apostles as head of the church to replace the 12 tribes of Israel that were headed up, of course, by the 12 descendants of Jacob. In other words, from, the mo from that moment on, Jesus was showing his Jewish disciples that he was going to achieve his salvation purposes for the world with the church rather than with ancient Israel. In the Old Testament, God had laid a foundation using ancient Israel, but now he was going to take his plan forward using the church. God's new humanity would be people from all nations, not just people from one nation. The church is the fulfillment of what started with Israel, which means that 11 apostles simply won't do, because then the church would be something less than what ancient Israel was. So the fulfillment of the 12 tribes of Israel needs to be the 12 apostles. And so Peter rightly sets about filling Judas's spot, who, as we heard, had committed suicide by this point. Now, don't get confused by the mention of Judas here in this list in verse 13. Judas hadn't come back from the dead, and Thaddeus hadn't gone AWOL. You see, the name Judas was one of the most popular names in, Je in Jesus' day. You wouldn't have thought so. I mean, how many of you know a Judas today? I mean, literally. You might know several metaphorically. But it was one of the most popular names. Judas simply means praised one. Someone who is praised. Uh, I know someone whose son is called praised. So I know another, uh, another Zulu guy whose name is blessing. The Zulu people have a wonderful way of giving names that mean something rather than just sound nice to their children. So praised one. Judas is, was the praised one, was well, certainly in his mother's eyes. And Jesus had actually chosen two Judases in the original 12. Judas Iscariot and Judas Thaddeus. Understandably, it seems like after Judas Iscariot's betrayal, Judas Thaddeus had chosen just to quietly drop the Judas part of his name and went about being known as Thaddeus from that time onwards. So Judas Iscariot is gone, and Peter knows that there needs to be 12 apostles for God's plan to be acceptable to the Jews because the 12 tribes deal was a big thing to them. And so Peter sets about to fix the problem. But before he does that, don't overlook verse 14. It says they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. You see, Jesus had told his followers not to do anything until he sent them the Holy Spirit. But that didn't mean that they just sat around watching Netflix all day. No, the early believers all got together, we read, to pray. And, <clears throat> and not just the remaining 11 apostles, did you notice, but also the woman, we're told, and also Mary, Jesus' mother, and Jesus' brothers, who you might remember had earlier been convinced that Jesus had lost his marbles. Now his family are there with the apostles, joining them in prayer, risking life and limb as they join up in the, that room in Jerusalem. And we're told they're praying. I think the message is that Jesus' mission is something we can all be part of or should be part of, even if in our pasts we were enemies of the gospel. Jesus gives every believer a part to play in what he's doing in the world, starting with prayer. I was so encouraged by the number of people who signed up to cook meals for the youth group. Uh, that is an amazing way, like I said, of serving 
the young people of Hawaii, not just of our church. Most of them don't come to this church. But the meal part of a Friday evening is that it's really important to build relationships with these youngsters so that they will listen when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And so what a privilege to be part of reaching the youth, like I say, without having to run around uh, and play games with them on a Friday. Jesus had said that these people would be his witnesses, but that they would need to be empowered by God to do the job. And so what do they do? They turn to God in prayer to ask God to do what God had promised to do, to give them the Holy Spirit, to help them to be witnesses. And when we get to chapter 2, in answer to their prayers, Jesus does send the Holy Spirit. And when Peter preaches the gospel again, in answer to their prayers, 3,000 Jews turn to Christ and become Christians and are baptized. You see, when God promises to do something, that doesn't mean that we're off the hook and we don't have to pray anymore. You know, God's promised it. He'll do it. I don't need to pray. No. Nor does it mean that prayer is pointless simply because God has promised to do that thing. It's actually only God's promises which make it worthwhile praying. And it's only God's promises that mean that we can pray about his promises with confidence. God reveals his will to us and then invites us to pray his will into being. So don't devalue or underestimate the role of prayer in the mission of reaching the world with the gospel. On that note, why not join us every Monday at 7 in the morning on Zoom? You can join our prayer meeting as easily as pressing a button on the website. You don't, don't even have to get out of your pajamas. 7 o'clock every Monday, and, and this Thursday, join us at 11 o'clock as we pray about the kingdom of God growing in Howick, something he has promised to do if we preach the gospel. Just because he's promised to do it doesn't mean we don't pray that he will do it. Come and join us. So you can be part of God's promises for the future by praying and witnessing in the power of the Holy Spirit. But secondly, you can trust God's promises for the future. Have a look at verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among, among the believers, a group of about 120, and he said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry with the payment he, he that is Judas, had received for his wickedness. He bought a field and there he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out, and everyone in Jerusalem heard about that, and so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. Well, do come to one of our Bible studies to figure out what's going on there. We'll look at that more in more detail then. For, Peter continues, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his, Judas's place, be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. So in other words, Ju Judas's betrayal was not a surprise to God. And it certainly is no reason to doubt God. It's actually a reason to trust God even more because Peter says this is exactly what God had said would happen. In other words, Jesus' followers hadn't only been praying, had they? They had also been reading their Bibles. They had been scouring the Old Testament, trying to make head or tail of what was going on and, and, and how God could possibly have let his son die on the cross. And Peter comes across two passages from the book of Psalms, which he quotes here, written a thousand years earlier by King David, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. The Psalms that show uh, that just as King David was opposed and betrayed and attacked, and just as King David trusted God to judge his enemies and raise up leaders for his people after he was gone, so Jesus, God's true king, was opposed and betrayed and attacked. And like David, Jesus also trusted his father to judge his enemies and raise up leaders for the church once he was gone. You see, Jesus is the greater David. He is the true king. Peter points out that Judas's betrayal of Jesus wasn't an unexpected turn of events. In fact, 
when you read Mark's gospel, three times in three chapters, Jesus tells his disciples that he is going to be betrayed, that he's going to be killed, and that he's going to rise again from the dead. And if you read your Old Testament, you see that this was God's plan all along. The wicked betrayal of Jesus by one of his closest friends didn't frustrate God's plans. It fulfilled God's plans. Now, what does all that mean for us? Simply that you and I can know that nothing will stop God from fulfilling his promises. You see, God's word of promise don't simply express what God hopes to achieve. I don't know, sometime in the future. No, God's future plans become a sure thing the minute he expresses those plans in words, in a promise. You see, God's words don't just express his will like our words express our will. No, God's words accomplish God's will. And so in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And light has to appear to fulfill the word of God. And when God says that anyone who puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ will have their sins forgiven, well, then your sins have to be forgiven the minute you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to fulfill God's word. It's got nothing to do whether you feel forgiven or even if you can forgive yourself. Come judgment day, nothing Satan says or nothing anyone else says can change the fact that God forgives those who have trusted Jesus' death in their place according to the promise of God. So God's promises are trustworthy. But how do we know what those promises are? What are God's promises? And that's what verses 21 to 26 are all about. You can be part of God's promises for the future. You can trust God's promises for the future. And you can trust what God's chosen witnesses say about Jesus. You see, the focus now shifts from what God said in the Old Testament a thousand years before in the book of Psalms to what he's going to be saying in the future through these apostles. Look at verse 21. Therefore, says Peter, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go to where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and so he was added to the 11 apostles. So a replacement for Judas has to be chosen to become the 12th apostle. We read that there are 120 people to choose from to make this appointment. So how do they choose? And we see that there are three qualifications to becoming an apostle. Firstly, they say you have to have been with Jesus for the full three years from his baptism until his ascension. Secondly, we see you have to be a witness of his resurrection. That doesn't mean you had to be in the cave, in the tomb, when his body started warming up and, and breathing again. No, it just means you had to have had a personal encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And so that you could testify firsthand that he had risen from the dead. And lastly, you had to have been personally chosen by Jesus. You had to have been chosen, called, and appointed by Jesus to be an apostle. And so when the other apostles cast lots, they aren't choosing a successor. They're actually letting Jesus choose the successor. And in fact, that's what they say in their prayer. Hey, which of these two you have chosen? They say to Jesus, show us which one you have chosen. But why are these three specific qualifications? Well, as Peter says, Judas's replacement is going to have to be able to witness about Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. The replacement apostle needs to be a fellow eyewitness who can speak and then eventually write with authority about Jesus. I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone alive who can actually call themselves an apostle if these are the qualifications. But people do, don't they? 
there are lots of people running around calling themselves apostles. Well, were they really around from the time of Jesus' baptism? Did they witness his, him and his resurrected body? And did they see him ascend? I don't know. Maybe it's just me being skeptical. It's interesting that when the apostles start dying out, Jesus doesn't replace them with, with another apostles. He replaces them with presbyters and bishops and elders to run the church, not more apostles. You see, the apostles' job was to start the church to make sure it was going to be built on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's it. You see, Jesus wanted to make sure that the message that was going to be preached was the true account of what he actually said and what he actually did. I'm sure you can sympathize, can't you? I'm sure you don't like being misrepresented. I certainly don't like it when people say, Andy did this or Andy said that, when actually I didn't. If we don't like that, well, why should Jesus put up with it? Like us, surely he has the right to be known as he really is, so that people can judge for themselves whether to follow him based on facts. Well, Proverbs 16 says that the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And so the apostles use lots to see who Jesus has chosen between Matthias and Joseph. Now, that doesn't mean that we can choose a career or maybe a husband by flicking a coin or by drawing straws. It's interesting that in the very next chapter, after Jesus sends out the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, you never, ever hear of people casting lots in the church again. In chapter 6, they have to choose deacons. They don't choose them by casting lots. Chapter 14, they have to choose elders. They don't choose them by casting lots. The reason is that after Pentecost, God expects us to prayerfully read his word with the help of the Holy Spirit that we have now received to make decisions that will align with his will. But here the apostles don't have the Holy Spirit yet, and so they cast lots to see who Jesus has chosen. As the years go by, the apostles start dying out, and, and the remaining apostles start writing down what they witnessed and what they heard Jesus say, and what they saw Jesus do, so that future generations, us, can be sure about what Jesus said and did. So Mark writes his gospel first, uh, then Matthew, and then uh, Luke, and then John. Mark, of course, and Luke weren't apostles, but Mark was Peter's uh, scribe, so it's really Peter's gospel, uh, written down by Mark, and, and Luke, we've heard, uh, he, he uh, interviewed our witnesses, and he interviewed the apostles, and John, of course, was an authentic apostle, and that means that now, 2,000 years later, we are sitting with a true, authorized, eyewitness account of Jesus, and so we too can go and spread the true apostolic gospel. That means that you can meet and get to know the real Jesus through the words of his witnesses. Well, let me wrap up. We've seen that we can be part of God's promises for the future because God has given us the privilege of having our prayers included in his plans for the world. And by working through human agents like you and I, God reaches the world with his gospel. Secondly, we've seen that you can trust God's promises for the future because he always keeps his word, even if it takes a thousand years. And thirdly, you can trust God's chosen witnesses about Jesus because they were eyewitnesses and they were chosen and they were authorized to speak and write what they saw and heard. The apostles are trustworthy messengers of a trustworthy message. Someone has said that the apostles are a bit like an airline pilot who have been selected and tested and authorized to take you safely to meet and spend time with friends and relatives you could never otherwise get to know. But in the case of apostles, they were selected and tested and authorized to take you to Christ so that you can get to know him through their writings. And he himself, Jesus, was selected and tested and authorized to take you to God the Father through his perfect obedience and his sacrificial death in your place for your sins on the cross. 
That means if you have absolutely no interest in meeting Jesus and getting to know him, well, then don't open your Bible. Don't read your Bible. But if you want to know the God who made you and loved you and died for you, if you want to know the joy and the peace of finally finding your place in God's plans for the world and the relief of having your guilt and shame removed, well, then start reading your Bible. Start listening to the words of the eyewitnesses whom Jesus chose and sent out to offer eternal life to a lost world. Let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you that we who are living hundreds, thousands of years after your son walked on the earth are not left groping around in the dark, nor have you left us to our own thoughts and ideas about Jesus. Thank you that we can have certainty of what he said and did. Thank you that we can know with certainty that he rose from the dead to give us life. And thank you that we can not only know these things about him, but that we can know him and know him personally through his words spoken to us through his apostles. So help us to know him better and better and to delight in him more and more as we seek to live and witness for his honor and glory. Amen.